So I like to say that everybody has their own investor DNA. And so we're all just different people. I don't believe we're all in this together. <laughs> we're all different. And uh, we're all looking for different wants, needs, and desires. Our education interests are all different. Welcome to the stage, Nicholas Bailey. How do I start to try? What can I do? What's the next thing I can do? The most unselfish thing a person can do is expand. No other option besides hard work. How they can live this three-dimensional lifestyle. YouTube, what's going on? Nicholas Barely here. Welcome back to the channel. Today's episode is all about finance, crypto, gold. It's going to be absolutely insane when it comes to investing from one of the top industry experts in the world that has over 300,000 subscribers on YouTube and is literally has a deal right now with iHeartRadio doing a radio show all over the country. Now, before I get there, I actually have a gift for you guys. You guys can check out my book, Modern Day Businessman Success Without Sacrifice, 100% free. Check it out in the description, nicholasbailey.com slash ebook. I want to give it to you as a gift. The only thing is you invest the time to read it. Go ahead and grab that for free. It's absolutely phenomenal. Hundreds of thousands of dollars invested on my end to make that a reality, 100% yours for free. Now, today, like I said, I have an awesome guest for you guys that has deal with iHeartRadio, is out there, has invested his own money year after year from dot-com bubble all the way to this bubble when it comes to crypto, or is it a bubble at all? You guys will find out here in this episode. Welcome up, Mark Moss. Mark, welcome to the BDB podcast, man. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, dude, I was checking. We met, was it 2019? FHL or was it 2018? I think it was 2019. It must've been. The first event I attended was the 2017 and it was uh, the, a fat event in uh, Boise, Idaho, which was then they did the stadium thing, like the record breaking Guinness yeah, Book yeah. world record thing. Yeah. And I think that at, at the 2019 funnel hacking live, we like ran into each other. I remember the hallway. I remember sitting there chatting it up. We we're talking about motocross. We we're talking about off road. And yep. all that stuff is really cool. I think in the entrepreneur space, people far off, like they don't enough find people that actually have commonalities or things that they do that are in common, like motocross or racing or any of these things. I think it makes people really fun. So without that, we probably would have never chatted. You were in like yeah. finance, crypto space and YouTube. And I was like, I don't do any of those things. Like, right. But it, the other commonalities outside of it were really cool. So not only are you a father, but a dirt bike rider, plus all these other crazy things, plus a finance expert, plus your YouTube channels absolutely exploded. So I'm really excited to jump into a bunch of things and I just want to honor and, you. And I this. worked really hard to try to get you on some dirt bike rides, but it just never worked out. So, <laughs> Hey, like, you know, got to sell harder, man. Like, where's my newsletter? Where's my follow-up? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. I, all right. I need to publicly state here that I need to go on a trip. What do I need to bring? So if I want to go on a trip. What do I need to, what do I need to do? Oh, uh, you need a dirt bike and you need some gear and, and uh, a good attitude. And that's about it. So how, can someone bring me it? Can I rent someone's dirt bike? I got the, all the gear. Yeah, that's the problem is the dirt bike situation. So uh, I don't. And maybe uh, I buy a bike when I fly in and then go over the border or something like that with the bike. Right. We're talking yeah, Mexico for sure. trips, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. So I, I'm in. Can I bring a friend? Yeah. Uh, well, if they're a good rider, depends on which trip I'm doing. So we have, uh, I do a couple big trips a year. We do one uh, every July, which we just finished, which is a big fundraiser for an orphanage down in Mexico. Nice. We raised uh, about 260,000 for them this year, which is amazing. We've raised over a million dollars for them in the last decade. Um, and so we do this big ride. We bring everybody down. It's a super fun ride. Everybody's invited. Everybody pitches in to raise money for the orphanage. Um, then we have more serious rides. And so you kind of have to get vetted to get on some of those. So it just depends, but, but we'll work something out. Shoot, dude. I mean, I only get to ride like once or twice a year, so I better be in shape for these freaking rides then. I, I'm, yeah. I'm excited for that. I want to, I got to get back into it. my wife always pesters me literally like how much better can it get than my wife pesters me to get a bike and start riding again. And I'm just like, I know that I'm just going to take it too seriously. I know I'm going to be going to the tracks all the time and stuff. You so. know what the, what a common story is from a lot of people that come and we encourage this, of course, but a common story that we hear, and I know you lead men uh, to, to performance and whatnot. So it's probably not strange for you, but uh, a common story that we hear is that um, when they go back home after these rides, like their wife likes them better, their employees or their coworkers like them better. 
And I believe it's because, uh, you know, they're out there living their best self and they're like, um, you know, they're getting perspective of seeing poor people in Mexico. So that perspective is huge, uh, but also just, you know, pouring into yourself, kind of living on the extreme edge a little bit. And it, I think it just puts life into perspective and you come home and typically, uh, like I said, people think you're better off and we encourage people like go home and be a better husband, go home and be a better coworker. That way they want you to go again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what made you even get into this though? Because like you have so many other things going on. What makes, what made you get into it? And then what makes you continue to do it when you have other things that you could focus on? Well, growing up in Southern California, it's a very unique place. And so uh, we kind of have like action sports, like epicenter right here in Southern California. And so I, I've just been kind of an adrenaline junkie, I suppose. And so uh, I chased a pro snowboard career. I mean, I surf at a pro level. I chased big waves around the world. I got a jet ski to go chase even bigger waves down in Mexico. Uh, grew up r- dirt racing dirt bikes. So like anything that goes like really fast, I'm into. Um, and so just just racing dirt bikes, you know, growing up doing that. And then um, it was uh, never, never rode like off-road, anything like that. And about 16 years ago now, in 2006, uh, me and a buddy decided like, let's see if we could ride our dirt bikes from the California border all the way to the tip of, of Baja, Mexico, down to Cabo San Lucas. Uh, within like a month or two, we, we put this trip together, like 12 buddies. It was just kind of like, let's just go do it. Um, and then the next year, more people want to go. The next year, more people want to go. We started doing like web episodes. The next thing you know, TV networks wanted to pick it up and it just kind of grew and grew and grew. Um, now it's on ABC. It's on that on network television. And uh, we've been doing it for 16 years now and we've, we have other trips. Um, and so it's just, it's just passion. Um, you know, the common trap that I see most people fall into is that, um, you know, they go chase a career. They were told to get a good job, right. Save for retirement. Um, and then whatever time they have left, they'll try to get a little like fun on the side. And for me, it was the opposite. Like for me, like I built a career around the lifestyle that I wanted to have. And so I want to go chase waves at the drop of a hat. I was just in El Salvador last week, as a matter of fact. Uh, I mean, I want to go uh, go ride dirt bikes or whatever. And so I built this lifestyle that allows me to continue to doing that, even though I don't really work in those industries. That is wild. Because when I think about the co- even things, traps that I've fallen into is obviously like sacrifice fun to be able to work. For me, like I just didn't feel that I had this idea and I started going out there and riding motorcycles and then started filming it. And then it like, kind of blows up and could you see like in other people's perspective they're like oh that's cool that that happened but people are trying to manufacture this yeah like for me i was like oh man i need to work so i need to sacrifice fun or maybe you know things like when it comes to going out there and, and building your business around that style that lifestyle can be super difficult for people how have you been able to maintain that or have you have you ever had a time where the work you kind of start doing the opposite of what you plan where you start working too much, you get too involved in it and you realize, holy crap, I'm not even living the life that I literally built this entire business from. Have you ever gone through that? Uh, for sure. You know, and I believe that life, uh, a lot, a lot of questions that you would get asked by newer aspiring entrepreneurs. I'm sure you've been asked this a hundred times is like, how do you find that balance? Um, I believe that life is about being out of balance pretty much regularly. Um, and, but then trying to bring it back into balance. So there's seasons where, I might neglect going to the gym because I'm really working hard, or I might not take a trip for a while because I'm really working hard. And so there definitely are times where you're out of balance doing different things. The very first time, the very first business I started, I sold my dirt bike and my wave runner to get enough money to start my business. And so that was obviously when I was really young, but like, that was an example of like, well, I did sacrifice those things temporarily to build that up. Um, but so there, there are seasons where I might sacrifice things. Um, and I've, I've kind of been like a work hard, play hard. So like, I kind of get like inspired and I work really, really hard. And then like, I want to go like, uh, check out for a while. Uh, but it's a constant battle. And I think, um, I think one, like you want to identify, and this is where uh, most entrepreneurs, most people really fail at this one piece. And I, I believe it's the most important. Um, I read all these goal setting books, trying to figure out this personal development. I chased it for like 10 years. And at the beginning of all the goal setting books, they would tell you to outline or write down your like top four or five values. And I would always skip over that. I'm like, dude, just let me get to the goal setting part. Right. Um, but then I realized like you can't ever set a goal if you don't know what your values are. And so um, for me, I had to kind of figure that out. And then and that's like a litmus test that I can look at everything else in life on. So for me, like my number one value is freedom above everything. Um, then it's growth. Then it's like serving others. Um, and so 
everyone might say, well, freedom's my goal, my, my value too, but it's not, right? A lot of people want consistency. A lot of people want dependability, things like that. And so for me, that sits at the top. And so then um, as I've gone through my career, I have to gauge that against every opportunity. So for example, um, just now, I was just telling you, I just got to deal with iHeartRadio. Um, I create content. Uh, I'm trying to build my brand. It's been working out really well for me iHeartRadio contacted me and they want me to do a nationally syndicated radio show. They said, they said they think I could be the next Rush Limbaugh and they want to help me get there. They're going to put a ton of money behind me. They run, I mean, they run the biggest names, you know, Sean Hannity, whatever is on their network. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Like, let's do it. I'm in, right? They're going to put money behind me to build it up. And then they said, okay, so we need five one hour episodes a week. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Because my number one value is freedom. I want to be able to leave at the drop of a hat and go to El Salvador. How do I balance that out? And the answer is I had to turn it down. I'm not going to do it because my number one value is freedom. And I know it goes against that. And I know it creates stress in my life. So we ended up negotiating a deal where I now I'm going to launch the nationally syndicated radio show, but it's going to be one three hour episode a week. So I'm going to run a weekend show. It'll be three hours a week <clears throat> and I can pre-record it so I could do it and then still have the flexibility to leave if I want. Uh, but that's like an example of like understanding your core values and then having that as a guide to like make decisions moving forward. Yeah, there's a good quote that I learned from Cole Hatter actually a few years ago, which was build your business around your life, not your life around your business. Yeah. And that's always been a thought in my mind. Just like you said, it's like you have those there so you don't go too far down a road that you have to turn back from and be like, oh, what am I doing? Why did I do this? So why did I get in this situation? You could have taken that deal and then hated your life. Yeah. Now, when you talked about the video stuff, I think it's interesting because people go check out your YouTube channel and see hundreds of thousands of subscribers and probably millions and millions of views and all these things. Yet you talked about how it first started with like doing the motocross stuff and it naturally grew and then you started filming things. And, you know, there's times where people have these great ideas where they think, oh, well, I'm going to I'm doing this epic stuff. I want to film this or maybe they do epic stuff and they like, have you ever been in that point where you're like, I don't really feel like filming crap. Like, I don't want to like just sit here and capture everything. Like it takes away from the experience. Like, has there been a, I have a few different questions around this, which is like, one, have you ever not wanted to film for the guys out there that like, don't want to press record. And two, has it, has most of the things you've done actually been like, I'm having fun. So I'm going to record this. And then it just blew up. Or has there been some discipline around it too, where you're like, I got to put out an episode. Like, let's, let's make this thing happen. Kind of walk yeah. me through that process. Cause I feel like for me, I struggle with it as well. You know, there's times yeah. where I want to times where I don't want to. Well, I would say, uh, I mean, you, this might sound surprising, but, um, I never want to. And as a matter of fact, I don't ever. So, um, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, and, I, and I'm being serious. So like uh, Gary V says, don't create document, right? Yeah. That's what Gary V says. Document everything. Don't create it. Uh, no, that's not for me. I create everything. I do not document anything. I do not like to, I don't pick up a camera ever. I'm the worst at social media. So my social media is run by a team who takes my pillar content and breaks it down into micro content. And yep. so all my content is created. Now, um, recently I've been doing a ton of trips now that things kind of open back up. I have my media team come with me. And so they've been like grabbing stuff and putting on social media. So we recently did this trip to Baja. We raised money. So I had them down there with me. They put that up. I took them down to El Salvador. They started putting that up, but because I can't do it, uh, I don't like it. And, and, uh, I live a life that, uh, not trying to say this in the wrong way, but like, I live a life that most it, influencers would probably pay to pretend they have. Um, but I don't care if anybody knows. So I don't ever grab a camera. I don't ever post it. Um, so um, everything I do is created intentionally um, versus like uh, vlog style, like check out my life. Look how cool I am. If that makes sense. Yeah. So there's, you wouldn't, if, if it wasn't about, and maybe bring me through your motivation because I don't want to say it wrong, but if it wasn't about the business, let's say for me, I would have never posted on social if it didn't grow the business. And inside mm -hmm. of that, I found a lot of satisfaction and how it's helped people. But I wasn't like, oh, let me tell them what I'm eating today because it might help yeah. somebody. I'm like, I, I give I give two craps. Like, I just wanted to be fit. Like, I just yep. didn't care. And then when I was like, oh, I could sell something like then help someone. Cool. I'm going to post about what I eat. That was just naturally yep. it happened for me. So yep. I don't want to take away the motivation, but it was like, 
if it wasn't for growing the businesses or making the impact or any, or creating your freedom, you probably wouldn't even be on social or making the videos. Is that Yeah, that's exactly right. And it's, it's the making the impact piece. So I told you a second ago, like what my values are. So yep. one of my other values is being a servant. So like, I, I believe happy people serve others. And uh, I've believed that throughout my career that if I help people get what they want, I get what I want. And so um, every piece of content I create, I always make sure or I ask myself, will this provide value? And uh, people are like, hey, Mark, let's jump on your show and talk. I'm like, what are we going to talk about? Oh, we'll just talk. I'm like, no, that doesn't work. Like, I want to make sure whatever I'm going to do is going to create value for people. And so I've taken that approach. And then, uh, as I said, if I help people get what they want, I get what I want. So I don't really think about like, will this increase business for me, which ultimately it, it is, but it's really every piece of content I create is like, how does this create value to somebody? What does this give them? What does this teach them? What can they take from this? And to your point, yeah, nobody cares what I'm eating. Uh, maybe at some point, if I got big enough, people would care, but I, I feel it, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting. You asked me this question because it's something that I'm conflicted with. Like, I feel like I'm a pretty private person, which is why I guess I don't post anything about my life. I only post that, that created content. I'm thinking about the container for every person out there right now, they can take whatever they do and put it in this container that we're talking about. Like, let's say YouTube, like you've blown up, you've taken something that you enjoy doing, enjoy teaching, built a business around it, not only from YouTube influence, followers, views, ad revenue, all that stuff, but you could do yeah. sponsorship deals if you wanted to, all that stuff, but also you built a business around it. What made you get into the vehicle of video and content? Like, was there something that inspired you? Because even filming the Baja stuff back in the day or the, the stuff that's on NBC that you were talking about, it's like something told you, oh, this is the way to get this out here was video. Because for some other people, it was door knocking or cold calling or all yeah. these different avenues. You've taken this video approach that's proven to be what everyone dreams they wish they would have done back in the day. You're on YouTube, like the best place you could ever be that isn't really yeah. social media. It's a search engine. Like, I wish I would have taken that avenue. What made you get into it? Was there something that inspired you? Well, my, uh, again, I, I never cared about putting my life on the internet at all. And as a matter of fact, I enjoyed being on the internet because it allowed my anonymity. Um, as far as filming the stuff in Mexico and getting it on TV, that was all my buddy, my uh, best friend. He's, he's, he's a TV personality. So it was all him. I just happened to be there with him and I didn't object to it. So even getting it on ABC, I mean, he's kind of... I kind of run the back office admin side. He's the, he's, he's a TV personality. So, so, so that wasn't me. That was him. Um, I, I always enjoyed the anonymity of being online, even using, uh, you know, uh, different names and whatnot. Um, what happened is um, it was more necessity. So what happened is I was writing a cryptocurrency research newsletter from like 2016, 2017, when I was at that fat event uh, in 2017 in Boise, I was there to like figure out the perfect webinar for my, my crypto newsletter. Uh, but then at the end of, and I was running Facebook ads, going to the webinar, et cetera. But at the end, I think in December of 2017, Facebook, Google, everybody shut down all advertising for crypto products instantly. And it was like, well, crap, what am I going to do now? And uh, my partner at the time, he was a technical analyst trader and he started just, go, he went on YouTube and just started like, going live and like letting people watch him, you know, do the technical analysis. And it started blowing up really big. And uh, after a while, he's like, hey, and it was generating leads and sales for us. It actually did really good. As a matter of fact, we launched a brand new product in uh, Je December 2017. And we did uh, we did a million dollars in 28 days. Boom, right on that. Just just off of YouTube. Um but then after a couple of months, he's like, Mark, you need to come on the channel and do some videos with me. And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't want to be known. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want that. Um, I was writing the, I was writing the newsletter, but they just had my name, not my face or anything. And he's like, no, you have to do it. Like, you're my partner. You need to be on here. I'm like, I don't want to. And it, it kind of got to this like fighting point. And I was like, all right, fine. So I did some videos with him, like him and I together. And I kind of enjoyed it. Um, and then I started doing them on my own on his channel. And after a while they started blowing up and he's like, dude, get off my channel. Like <laughs> you have to start your own. And I was like, I don't want to start my own. I never wanted my own. And, uh, he's like, you need to be helping with the marketing. So he kind of forced me into it. Um, I found that I really like it, enjoy it. And now I think it's been three years and, um, I could never have imagined three years ago, all the additional benefits that come from a YouTube channel or, or, or having a platform, I should say, um, that people that I, that I never would have imagined back then. So it's been an amazing journey.
That's so wild. And it's interesting how like each step, like one thing unlocks another thing. Like if you would have never made the videos with him, you would have never gotten on YouTube, never created your own YouTube channel. And so it just also points back to just taking action on the opportunity yep. in front of you. Even if like it wasn't going to build your YouTube channel anyway, even if you did that video, it was never going to really build your thing. But that's what opened you up to it. Talk to me a little bit about YouTube before we go into some finance stuff, because I know I have some questions around what's going on now. Things have changed a lot, what to look forward to, right? Yeah. If we would have done an interview a couple of weeks ago, we would have been talking about how low crypto is and how it's like down and all these things. And now we're like, oh my gosh, we're ramping back up. So things change quickly. Yep. But on YouTube side, like what's some of the things that you've done since then? Because this is a hard place for people to get into. They're they're trying to figure out tags, and keywords, and what are people searching for? And what am I going to make a video about? If someone were to take their current brand, let's say they're in action, they're making sales, and they wanted to jump on YouTube to build the following, become an authority figure, and actually sell, create leads. What are some of the things right now, if you were to start over, new industry? Not in finance, not, not in crypto, none of these things. Brand yep. new industry, and you wanted to go in and dominate it. What would you do? Yep. Um, it's it's actually easier than, uh, it, it's like most things in life. Um, what's the what's the key to losing weight? Uh, eat less calories yeah. than you burn. Like simple, right? Uh, but that's, it's, it's simple, but not easy to do. And so YouTube is actually pretty simple and not easy to do. The biggest thing is just like losing weight, getting in shape, building a business, like anything, it takes time. So to think you're going to come in and have this massive success in 30 days, you're going to be really uh, set up for failure. Um, to get your first hundred subscribers is so hard to get. Then to get to a thousand is like insane. I think I added 32,000 in the last 28 days now, right? So it's like this like snowball that starts growing. So eventually, right, it, it builds steam. Uh, but what I would say first thing is uh, first thing you want to do is clearly identify the niche that you want to be in, um, or the people that you want to reach. So one or the other. Um, I think typically going after like your avatar is probably a better way, uh, because it gives you a little bit more free range. But that being said, you really need to pick about like three or four pillars that you're going to talk about on a regular basis and stick within that. Unfortunately, YouTube wants to pigeonhole you because it wants to know who you are and what content you put out. So it knows what to expect from you. If you're all over the place, it's going to make it pretty difficult. So for example, um, you could talk about, um, diet and exercise. You could talk about making money and you could talk about travel or whatever. And those might not be all related, but like you would stick with those three pillars, for example. Mm -hmm. So that'd be one, um, in the beginning, it's pretty hard to get traction. So what you want to do is, um, go after what people are already searching for. So use basic search engine, uh, tools, um, you can get plugins uh, um, that go right onto YouTube and they can just tell you what people are searching for, or you just start typing and it auto completes for you. So mm -hmm. it's like uh, how to lose weight. And then it starts, you know, suggesting all the other things. Yeah. And then I would start making videos based off of what people are searching for yeah. to help get that ball rolling today. I don't do that. Uh, my channel is big enough. I have enough momentum. I make videos what I want to make. I don't worry about what other people are searching for, but in the beginning that helps. And then just like all um, algorithms work, whether you're running Facebook ads or pay-per-click ads, um, I think about it like this, like, what is the, what does the platform want from me? Like we, what, what is their goal, right? Their goal is to provide a good experience to their users. Um, and so what do they want from me? Well, they want me to give content regularly. So they know they can depend on me every Tuesday and every Thursday and every Sunday, they know I'm going to put a new video up so they can start to plan their ad budgets around that. Right. They know I'm going to deliver that constant. They want consistency. Um, the other thing they want is they want to keep people on their platform. So they want me to be a good partner with that. So just like all those pay-per-click algorithms, it's click through rates and watch time. So like if you're running Facebook ads or Google ads, it'd be click through rate and then bounce rate. Right. Um, this is like, so that's kind of like it. So like um, if I have a really high click through rate, they're going to keep serving it up. If nobody's clicking on it, they're not going to serve it to anybody. And then if people click on it, but then they don't watch the video, then they're going to stop serving up. But if I have a high watch time, so click through rate and, and watch time are like the two main things. So first, Find the topics. Second, use search engine to find what people want to watch. Third, make sure you have a high click-through rate and a high watch time. So click-through rate should be should be should be ten percent at least uh, the first couple days. Um, it should average at least like four point five or better. Um, if you're not getting that kind of a click-through rate, so typically in the beginning, I'll see a really high click-through rate and it starts tapering down after a couple of days. Uh, but if you're not getting at least a 5% click-through rate, I mean, you need to go back to the drawing board. You should be over 10% for the first couple of days and then watch time. So what happens is 
um, at 10 minutes, maybe it's down to eight now, um, YouTube can put an ad in the middle. And so they, they, they want watch time. So if I have a 30 minute video and I have 50% watch time, that's 15 minutes. If you have a six minute video and you have a hundred percent watch time, it's only six. So my watch time is better than yours. Mm. So um, it's not just the percent, it's like the total watch time. So my videos, they used to be like 15 minutes lately, they get to like 25, 30, I'm trying to bring that back down. Uh, but I would say at least 10 minute videos, 15 minute videos, try to get like 50% watch time. And if you're not getting that 50% watch time, then you need to figure that out. And, and that's, that's good, good copywriting, right? So like give a good intro. So what I do is uh, I run like this uh, intro. It's like a hot intro. So it's like the hook, like what's going to hook them in. Um, then the outcome, what are they going to learn or see or hear watching the video? And then like a testimonial would be like, this is the same exact techniques that the best investors in the world use. It'd be like a testimonial about that. Um, and then throughout the video, you're hooking. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Before I get to that, let me tell you this. And you just kind of keep hooking to the end. Um, so th that, those would be probably the top things. The other thing I would say, like I said, consistency, if it's only once a month or if it's once a week or if it's twice a week, but make sure it's at the same date and time. And then also um, load the videos up in advance tip. I mean, at least 24 hours in advance, if you can do three days, even better. Um, the reason why is like the description and keywords don't really mean much anymore. Um, YouTube will transcribe your video and then they're going to try to um, place it in the algorithm based off of the transcription of your video. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, also the first 24 hours are the most crucial. And so you want it to come out of the gate hot. If you load it right before it goes live, it doesn't have time to rank it. So it's going to come out of the gate really slow. So if you load it in advance, it'll come out of the gate faster. And then you're going to want to put all your marketing efforts behind it for that first 24 hours to really get that boosted up. So good. You said so many phenomenal things there. That last part, super helpful. Also, like you were saying, as soon as you drop it, make sure every single person you can goes and engages and, and checks out that video. I wonder how that is for interviews as well, because interviews can go 30 minutes, an hour. You know, Joe used to be on YouTube back in the day. I wonder what that looks like for like, let's say an hour interview. If I were to do an hour yeah. interview, what type of watch time would be really good? Because that's a little bit longer, right? A little bit more. It's of tough. A I think my like Grant Cardone interview has like, I think it's 18 or 19 minutes is the average watch time out of like 50. I think it's about 50 minutes. Um, but yeah, you know, usually, Grant does something my... kind of dumb, like people go and find that video and like click on it just to say something like rude or something. Um, what's weird is, so I, I run my, my YouTube videos are like teaching videos. Um, and then I have the, uh, I have my podcast and I do put the podcast episodes on my YouTube channel. Um, what's interesting and, and it kind of sucks is that, uh, you know, I might get an average, I don't know, 70, 80,000 views on a video. Uh, my podcast might get 15 or 20. Yeah. Um, they don't get near the views. Um, the watch time, as you said, is way down. It's maybe 25, 30% watch time. So, um, people are getting through, you know, 20 minutes of an hour long interview. Um, and typically uh, a lot of times I'm actually losing subscribers over putting up interviews. It's crazy. Crazy. Um, but, um, then I have like another friend who started a YouTube channel. All he does is interviews. He started a year ago and he's up to like 120,000 subscribers. And all he does is do an interview a day and they love it. But, but that's on my what they channel, expect, like, right? Because like that's, that's what, what they subscribe. expect. That's what they expect. And so I put an interview on my channel. People don't like it. He built his channel super fast. All he's doing is interviews. And I wish I wish that was all I was doing. Um, uh, the, other, the other problem with interviews is because it's so long. Remember, I was telling you how they transcribe it and then they rank it. Um, on an interview, I might cover five or six topics. So then how do they know how to rank it? So what I'm doing now to get extra mileage out of those is then we're breaking those interviews down into micro content. So they might be, you know, two to six minute clips that cover one specific topic. So Nick, let's talk about gold. Hey, Nick, let's talk about travel. Hey, Nick, let's talk about, you know, bonds. And then that would be three separate subjects, three separate videos. And I'm putting those on a secondary channel right now. Uh, and then those are starting to get good traction. That's insane. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. So let's go, let's switch to finance. Yeah. We're going to break this up into a different category that we're going to, we're going to break this part of the video up. So what, what's some new things that you think people should, I remember being in 2016, 2015, my aunt came to me and she goes, Oh, you guys need to invest in Bitcoin. And I was like, 
what's that? Like, I thought she was in a multi-level marketing company because that's what it sounded like. I was like, I think she's like trying to ML, MLM us right now. Like, I was like, oh, dude, I don't, I don't want in your downline. Like, that's what I thought yeah. Bitcoin was. Yeah. And so sometimes we can like shut ourselves off to those opportunities and mo- more times than not, we think we're right because we never hear about them again. You know, it's like even the MLMs that do crush it, if they, if they don't and someone told you about it, you don't feel like you missed out. Whereas I'm sure everyone feels like they missed out when it came to cryptocurrency. Why? Because they didn't take action on it when they first heard it because of their bias of just like, no, that's stupid. It's a scam. You're going to lose. Mm-hmm. Well, my aunt put like all of her savings when Bitcoin is like 500 bucks. Like, yeah, she did a great job. And awesome. even my dad, like he would have had millions of dollars if he would have just said that. So what's that version now? Like, I know there's NFTs. My friend is messaging. He goes, I just made 80 grand off these NFTs that I bought for like no money, right? Like, is there things right now that are happening and emerging that you think we should put our attention on? So a couple of things I'd say about that. So first off, um, you know, I'm old enough to have uh, started my investing career in real estate, but then um, in, at, at the, at the dot com boom. And so um, in the late 90s, my roommate had quit his job and we're they doing these internet, we're day trading these internet stocks and um, so I lived through that that boom and bust. Um, I started my first internet business in 2001 at the bottom of that crash. So I have that perspective. Um, Amazon went from 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 five dollars to eighty dollars, crashed all the way back down to five after the dot com crash, um, and then you know then it bounced back up eventually after several years, got back to 60, 70, 80 bucks. Then it got to two hundred bucks, and everybody's asking the same question that you're at. You just asked me. It's too late. What's the next one? was it too late to buy Amazon at hundred bucks or 200 bucks or 500 bucks? And so I think uh, what people are missing is they're missing again. We, we, I mentioned earlier that long-term perspective, mm-hmm. everybody today's in this like instant, like uh, instant gratification. And it's just, it's just, it's just, it's, it's a trap, man. It's destruction. It's just disaster. Um, if you're only focused on instant gratification, you're just, you're never going to have success in any area, not your relationships, not your health, not your business, nowhere. So the first thing is people need to get rid of that. Uh, I tell people over and over that my wealth, my future is way too important to leave up to luck and chance, way too important for luck and chance. So you won't see me chasing these. I think probably what you're referring to is NFTs or these crypto punks just this last couple of days, they, they, they just blew up. Um, my wealth, my future is way too important to be chasing, uh, whether it's GameStop and the CME thing or whether it's the crypto punk. So I typically don't go after that. Just like I don't go to Vegas. I don't bet on football. I don't bet on horses either. So that's just me. I have lots of friends that love to bet on every game that's out there. And so for them, maybe, you know, the crypto punks is, is the way to go. Um, maybe I would not rather their main spend- source of income though, right? Like they, they, they go out there, they make money and they go out there and bet on everything. Like I'd be someone who'd bet on anything if someone asked me sure but i'm not trying to make my main income source betting on things or putting yeah. all my money into amc or gamestop like you said or any yeah. of these things right so i doubt they are either especially if they're your friends yeah um, so we so we so we like to focus on like long-term like fundamentals and so uh one thing that we do back to kind of using that amazon as an example was like well was amazon expensive i mean you could have got amazon at five bucks was it expensive of 200 well, expensive compared to what? Well, it was definitely expensive compared to a five bucks, but yep. was it cons- was it expensive compared to the two thousand or three thousand that it would eventually become? And the answer is no. And so, if we look at Bitcoin in the same way, I would also say the same way um, that it is 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 Bitcoin expensive or cheap? Well, compared to what? Compared to its future valuation? Heck, no. I believe personally, and so I've been in, in space since 2015, I wrote a cryptocurrency only research newsletter for four years from 2016 to 2019. Um, I speak at all the crypto and Bitcoin and blockchain conferences. Uh, so I kind of, you know, I have access to a lot of information and I would say that uh, we're just so early. I mean, it's so cheap still. And what happens is uh, you, you referenced your aunt who put everything in. I started buying Bitcoin in 2015 when it was like whatever, 400 bucks. And, uh, I wish I would have had the conviction then that I do now. If I would have put in just the amount of money I put in just this year back then, you wouldn't even know who I was. I'd be very on an island. You never yeah, even know yeah. from me, hear from me, right? But the problem was it was too risky. And so what happens is, um, and this is a big piece for everybody that's listening. Uh, what happens is most people investing, like you're maybe these people who are buying these NFTs, um, everyone's investing for the upside, right? How much money can I make? 
How quick can I make it? How big will this go? The real investors, the Warren Buffetts, the Stanley Druckenmillers of the world, they all invest based off of the risk. They think about the downside. Warren Buffett says the single most important rule of investing is to never lose money. And the second most important rule is don't forget number one, never lose money. So the professional investors always think about the risk, managing the risk, managing the downside, because if you lose all your money, it's really hard to get going again. So that's one way to separate the uh, knowledgeable investors from the beginner investors is, are they chasing the pumps or are they focused on the downside? So back in early 2015, Bitcoin is very risky. Uh, who knows what it was going to be? And so I could only put a little bit of money based off of that. But as it's grown, right, and throughout the years in 2017, we saw futures, that, you know, commodity futures exchange, start doing futures on it. And we started seeing, uh, you know, the ecosystem grow today. Now all the big banks and hedge funds are into it. Um, and so like almost all the risk has now been taken out of it. But yet we still have a 10x or 20x upside. So to me, right now, today, even though, yes, you could have bought it at 300 or 3,000 a year ago, um, even though you have to buy it at 40,000 today, it still represents to me what may be the best risk-adjusted investment that I've ever seen in my career. Because most of the risk has been taken out, but we still have a 20x upside. And that, that's just unheard of. Um, so I think if you look at it from that lens, it's, it's a little bit different. Right. You, you could even say that some people say, well... Even a month ago, I could have bought it at twenty-seven thousand or thirty thousand. Now it's forty thousand. It's like it, ne it never changes. And people say, "Well, what if I bought it at 60? And what's so crazy is that people say like it's so volatile. But really, I'm, I've been looking. I just looked at the chart before you came on here because I'm like, "Oh man, this guy's making me think about this." And I'm like, "Wow, if you actually just drew, drew like a little graph over the last few years of like the average of Bitcoin, I was like, this is phenomenal. Even when it went down." to the lowest low that it was at this year, I was like, that's really high. So I'm pretty well, a couple of things I'd say about that. One is to your point, uh, if you look at the lowest price every year, what was the lowest low every year for the last 11 years since it's been out? Every single year, the lower low has been higher, except for one. 2015 was the only year. So that means when you look at volatility, zoom out. If you're looking at your investments over like weeks and months, you're going to lose every single time. Like you'll never make money looking at investments on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. So people that are saying it's too volatile. Yeah. It's all the way back down to where it was a few months ago. And it's still 300% up in 12 months. Like mm -hmm. you call that volatile, like, um, and volatility works both ways. Volatility goes up and down. So if it was, if it wasn't volatile, that means it'd be stuck at zero. We don't like that. Um, and so it's been the, it's been up every year. It actually has a 200% compounded annual growth rate. Um, the other thing that I would say is that, um, when you're investing into new technology, this is where you're going to get the greatest you know, risk return or not even risk return, but greatest upside potential Uber, Airbnb, or whatever you want to invest into. Again, you have to have that long-term horizon. And, you, and what you, you need to do is you need to look at the development of the technology. So that would be the, the, the technology growth, the user base growth, like the network effects, um, not the price. So everyone that's looking at the US dollar value is getting confused as opposed to looking at the development on the protocol and the amount of user adoption growth. And what it's an interesting phenomenon because like Uber, for example, um, you know, that got pitched, I don't know, dozens of times around Silicon Valley and nobody wanted to invest into it because nobody knew what it was at the time. Um, and uh, I don't know, it's some rideshare app. How much is it worth? I don't know, hundred billion. How the heck did you get that number? Well, we can, if we can get this much from taxis and this much from limos and this much from vans, we get there. Okay, it makes sense, right? So somebody finally invested into it. When you invest into a, a venture capital deal like Uber, it doesn't go public for like a decade. So imagine if Uber went public on day one and you watch the price in real time. Uh, oh, Uber's moving to San Francisco. The price goes up. Oh, San Francisco voted to shut Uber down. And the price goes down. Oh, now they're going to Philadelphia. Oh, now Denver's shutting it down. And because you, you remember the path that Uber went, it wasn't an easy path. Imagine if every time a city said they were going to vote against Uber, the price would just drop, drop, drop. Um, so if, if we saw Uber over that first 10 years in real time, it would probably look a lot like Bitcoin. Um, because Bitcoin has been live since day one. Uh, but like I said, if you're just looking at the price, you're, you're missing everything. So for the average person, I remember reading, I think, Money Master the Game or something, and it was some smart guy saying that if you were out of the market 30 days or something like this over the last couple of decades, you'd miss out on the majority of the gains, like yep. on average. 
And I've always thought about that. For me, I bought my first got into cryptocurrency, let's say, because I know you talk a lot about a lot of different things and I don't want to yep. pigeonhole you to, to crypto, but it's fun and it's what people, you know, have yeah. a lot of upside, like you said. I love it. I, I bought my first Bitcoin maybe 2017, 4,200 bucks, 3,900 bucks. And then I invested in maybe like 15, uh, 15 other altcoins or ICOs at the time. And most of them did nothing. Some of them did well and it was fun. But is it similar? Like, how would you... What, how would you give advice to someone who's like the average person that doesn't have 10 hours a day to look at crypto to invest in it? Are you someone who thinks these people that buy and sell, buy and sell, or just like have Bitcoin and hold on to it for and keep buying more? What would be a good strategy? Yeah, so um, it depends on the person. So I like to say that everybody has their own investor DNA. And so we're all just different people. I, I don't believe we're all in this together. <laughs> We're all different and uh, we're all looking for different wants, needs, and desires. Our education interests are all different. Um, so for everyone, it's different. Um, what I can say is that I did write a cryptocurrency research newsletter for four years um, and it was like an investment newsletter. So each month it was like, hey, buy this one, hold on to it, buy this one, hold on to it. Um, during the time over that four years, I had 20 calls that went up over a thousand percent. But in order to get those thousand percent winners, you got to hold it for a long time, like, like nine months or a year, which isn't really that long. Um, we started, I told you, we launched a new, a new service, which was a, a trading service. So we sent out calls every day, buy this, sell it at this price, buy this here, sell at this price. That's the one we did like a million dollars in 28 days on. Um, and we ran the trading service for a couple of years. Um, in 2019, I had my partner buy me out of that business and I moved on uh, for two reasons. One, I don't believe in trading. So to answer your question, uh, the majority of traders just lose their money. Uh, it's a big waste of time. It's a lot of stress. And uh, for me, I would rather focus my time and energy on going and creating wealth in my business and not trying to sit here and day trade these cryptocurrencies that are super volatile, highly manipulated. And like I said, people just lose their money. Um, I also changed because... Um, I mean, the backstory on me, which we didn't really get to, but I was figured out how to create wealth pretty well. And I'm, I created a ton of wealth in 2008. I got completely wiped out in the housing crash in the, in the great financial crash, California got wrecked on real estate and, uh, I, I lost everything and not only lost everything, I was, I was millions of dollars in debt. And that's because I didn't understand like some core basic concepts of investing, like don't put all your money into California real estate. Like that would have been good. Uh, so what I saw right in this cryptocurrency newsletter and we crushed it. I mean, 20 calls. I had one call that went up 100,000%. That turns 500 bucks into $500,000. 500 bucks into half a million. It was insane. Um, but people thought diversifying was, well, let me sell this one crypto to buy this other crypto. And when the whole market dropped, and then, and then because things were going up so fast, I'm putting more money in. Next thing you know, they were 100% invested. Um, they thought their profits were diversifying to more cryptos. And when the market dropped 90%, they freaking lost everything, man. And so I was like, okay, I got to like, I got to go help these people. So I started a new newsletter that's a, a more diversified approach. So now I recommend assets that are in stocks, that are in gold, that are in still crypto, yes. Uh, but then, you know, real estate, income plays, things like that. So we can take profits that we make on crypto or whatever, and then we can turn that into cash flow. And so it's just a more comprehensive approach. So um, yeah, I think trading doesn't work. I would buy and hold. And then I would think about taking those profits and trying to put them into other assets. And are you still involved with real estate stuff to this day? Um, I am, except for, um, man, it's a, it's a tough business to be investing into. Uh, it's a tough market, I should say, to be investing into right now. Um, I, uh, I'm always actively looking for more deals to get into. Um, I'm actually building a, uh, income property in Mexico right now while I'm in escrow on, on the lot right now, and they're going to build it out. Um, so I'm trying to diversify some of my real estate outside of the country. Cause that's, that's a scary topic as well. Um, uh, but man, it's hard to find good, good yield right now in real estate. Um, and it's hard to pass up the opportunity that we have with Bitcoin. A hundred percent. Right. It, it's weird here in Austin because real estate's going up at such a rapid rate that it, the only thing I think about is when is that going to stop and how quickly is it going to change? What, do you have any thoughts on that? Like it's a whole different city, right? We have like a, like you talked about coins having manipulation, right? You could have a bunch of your friends buy it or have a big network or have a celebrity say something and change things, right? People get mad at Elon Musk because literally he could live the rest of his life just talking about something or bashing something yep. and be for it or against it and literally make money off of it if he wanted to. And it's weird to think, I was talking to my wife today about, 
you know, they say someone said that Donald Trump is the most hated president in U.S. history. And I, I'm like, what's so interesting is he's actually only the second president that's ever been alive with social media. Like there's only been Obama with social media and then there's been Trump with social media. And I think mm -hmm. that's very interesting how things have changed in that way. And so with that, even Austin, we have all these companies moving here. We have Oracle bringing salespeople, the average salesperson makes like 220 K there and they're all moving here. And so I'm wondering how different that's going to be because it's almost like, injecting all this stuff into this market have you looked here do you have any thoughts yeah on that? what first thing i would say is uh and not to get not to turn this into a political conversation uh because i i choose not to really spend too much time in that space uh but what i do try and do and i say this on every of my youtube videos is i say i'm trying to change the way you think about money because almost everything you've learned is wrong so that's kind of like my opening line and uh, the problem that we have today man is that uh, people have lost any ability to have rational or objective thought yeah. Uh, there's no critical thinking today. Uh, people look at headlines and they just believe them. And, and it's such a massive problem. I mean, you're an educator, so I know you feel it as well. So even just that statement, if you just thought about that for one minute, like there's just that that's that's the most false statement I've ever heard. So yeah. well, Obama right behind had, that Biden's the most loved president. Well, I Obama had more people turn out and vote for him than any president in history. Yep. Trump then had even more people than that. So he set the record for all, more votes in history. And then his next term that he lost to Biden had even more people than all in history. So Obama was the most, he was the, the then he was the most, and then he was the most again. We know that that's a fact. Now, Biden supposedly got more votes. Okay, whatever. But Trump beat the wreck, beat Obama's and beat his previous record to 100%. get more votes than any president in history. So for anyone to say he's the most hated president, I mean, uh, uh, that, that, there's not a shred of truth and, and not to get into the politics. And, debate. But even if he is, he also could be the most love. Like uh, people hate the Kardashians, but they have like hundreds of millions of followers and all the views. There's like, well, actually, equally yeah, that I, guess, many I, I guess you're actually right. So I, I guess, man, yeah, maybe I'm wrong uh, and I'm willing to change my mind. I guess maybe uh, he he had he's so polarizing that you either love him or hate him. So he probably has more people love him and more people hate him at the same time. <laughs> Possibly. But we yeah. do know people love him for sure. And yeah. just to say the one statement, it's yeah. kind of like just saying uh, Bitcoin, it goes really low and crashes and not talking about the upside of it. That, yeah. oh, Like yeah. all the positive things you said, it's easy to write headlines about Bitcoin sucking yeah. and crypto sucking yeah. when it sucks, right? So yeah. anyway. So anyway, on, but, but on to Austin answer your market, question, to answer your question about Austin, um, yeah, Austin uh, is a is a is kind of a well, Texas and Florida are both pretty unique in a sense where they're being flooded by people from around the country. Specifically, Texas is pulling people from California, and Florida is pulling people from New York. Um, Austin specifically is pulling in like the tech community, which obviously, as you, I think you said, like has a lot of money. I know, like around like I think it's Lake Austin. I mean, there's only so many homes on the lake. And you have all these people moving there and they're making 20 million, 50 million a year. What do they care if the house is an extra one or 2 million? They don't. And so they're just buying up and that property. Is, I mean, I talked to someone who, whose property went up a million bucks in 30 days there. Um, I think um, a couple of things that I think of when I look at like uh, asset bubbles, specifically in real estate, it's not a, not a super easy answer, but there's a couple of things I would say. First of all, um, real estate's expensive. It's kind of at its all-time high compared to what? And so this is where people are missing out. So every trade, every position is a trade. So I'm either going to trade you a house for dollars, a house for Bitcoin. I'm going to trade you a share of Apple for dollars. So dollars sit at the, on the Apple, uh, dollars are on the half of every transaction out there. So when we say that houses are expensive, expensive in what? Well, they're expensive in dollars. Okay. But dollars are the most manipulated thing out there. They've created 35% of all the dollars in existence today were created in the last like 14 months. So when they create the, when they increase the money supply by 35%, it distorts every single price signal that we have and it pushes all the prices up with it. So house prices are expensive, all to, uh, the most expensive they've ever been priced in dollars. Let me give you some perspective on that. So in 1971, we severed the tie of the dollar to the gold standard. 
And that allowed us, the United States to print as, as much dollars as they wanted. And that's when all the prices started getting distorted. So if we go back to 1970, the year before that happened, and we look at um, the, the median home price, priced in oil, how many barrels of oil did it take? Well, uh, it took about um, 6,500 barrels of oil to buy the median home price. Today, it's about 3,000 barrels. So are homes expensive or cheap? Well, priced in oil, they're really cheap. What yeah. about rice? Well, in uh, 1970, it was like 45,000 pounds of rice. Today, it's 25,000 pounds of rice. So priced in, priced in rice, <laughs> it's way cheaper. What about gold? Well, gold was, uh, gold was I think, uh, about 500 ounces of gold, and today it's 190. So priced in gold, homes have never been cheaper. And I can go on and on and on. But the point is, is all we're doing is looking at the US dollar value of things. We're, we're distorted all our metrics, and we don't really know what we're looking at. So we want to think about things in terms of purchasing power. Because just because the prices of things are going up in US dollar value doesn't mean they're getting more valuable. It still has purchasing power. So anyway, uh, I, I guess that's just a long, long way to say that homes aren't really as expensive as people think they are. So maybe we're not in the asset bubble that we think they are, um, but that doesn't mean they're not dangerous. And so the whole financial system is in, ma in massive danger right now. Um, it's only being kept alive because the Federal Reserve is continuing to pump out trillions of dollars. And when the Fed even talks about maybe one day pulling back just a little bit, the market crashes. So a month ago, the narrative for the last year is that the Federal Reserve says, we're not even thinking about thinking about raising rates. And the market's been pumping. A month ago, Jerome Powell said, we're thinking about maybe in two years raising rates. And the market crashed. From not thinking about thinking about to now thinking about maybe in two years and the market crash. He had to go on news 16 times to walk that story back. To Wasn't get the there even to one that got announced yesterday about they're going to have to start evictions for people that aren't paying rents and paying mortgages and stuff like this? Yeah, but now they've extended it. And so, um, so the markets are super fragile, and that's a great point, right? So if all these evictions started, the rent evictions and the, and the homeowner evictions started, that could potentially put a lot of downward pressure on the housing market. But then if the Fed and the government just pumped in $8 trillion over the last year to save the markets from crashing, they're just going to stop now? Like yeah. we just created $8 trillion out of thin air and ruined everything. Let's just stop now. What the heck? Like I would think they're going to continue going. Why yeah. wouldn't they? Why would they stop now? Uh, and so um, I guess the point of all that is just that the markets are very fragile and we don't know what's in the Fed's head. Will they continue or will they, will they not? Uh, I believe they will. They have no choice. If they even hint about, <clears throat> sorry, about stopping, the markets crash. And so, um, you know, will real estate continue going up in, in, in these areas? And I believe as long as the Fed continues to prop the markets, it, they, they will. And I think maybe for the next couple of years, we could continue to see prices going higher. Crazy. So you talked about inflation. I think that they put out there, there was something that happened where inflation, one of the measurements got changed a while back. You probably know this way, but like I'm like pulling it out of my ass. But inflation, they say is like 4% or something. But really, when you add that number into it, it's like 8% per year. And then obviously with what you just said, 35% of everything created, like that's probably caused a lot of inflation. Do you know like how how inflation's been affected? Since all this printing, yeah. So what what you're I think what you're referring to is is called CPI. It's a consumer price index, uh -huh. and that's the tool that the government uses to measure inflation. And it's a political tool. It's totally manipulated. Uh, I think what you're referring to is over the last couple of decades they've changed the way they calculate that number many times. Yeah. Um, and they change it to keep it showing low so they can keep printing more money. They keep saying, hey, we don't have inflation. We can keep printing, but that's because they keep changing yeah. the number. Um, but per their own number. The last, the, um, the last numbers that came out a couple of weeks ago showed a 5.4% CPI inflation. Now, to put that into perspective, what that means is that you lose over, over four years, you lose about 25% of your wealth. That's what that means. So, what happens is when they inflate, it's like a balloon, right? They're inflating the money supply. Every time they create a dollar, it makes all your dollars worth less. 
Yeah. So it's not that home prices went up in value. It's that the value of the dollar went down. So it takes me more dollars to buy those things. It's just a little bit of a different way of thinking about it. So at 5.4% inflation, which is what they showed you, which is a false number, but even at that, you lose 25% of your wealth in the next four years if you do nothing. And this, this is why I'm so now, interested in these like different things you're talking about holding is you look at, you got money, they're printing more and even gold, like when gold's high, you just mine more gold and you can like, they can go get more gold. But like you look at the like different cryptos and stuff like this, I'm starting, I'm trying to think when you're talking, I'm like, all right, well, they keep printing all this money and there's lots of inflation and I'm losing all this money. Well, I could just buy something that's just not being inflated and at least make the difference, right? Like people even would buy bonds back in the day at, at even if they had to pay money just to be able to have their money be worth just as much as when they bought the bond, right? Is this, yep. am I correct? Yeah, I'm because like, all, all of economics all boils down to scarcity. And really all economics, if we boil it down to like first principles level is all based off of time. Time is the most scarce resource in the world. It's the only resource in the world that I can't get more of. If I lose my Bitcoin, I lose my gold, I lose my oil, I can go get more of it. I can't ever get more of my time back. Um, it's the most scarce resource. And so everything's based off of that. So that scarcity factor. So out of all those cryptocurrencies, which ones are scarce? So Dogecoin, I think they create 10,000 new coins a day. Maybe it's 10,000 an hour, but it's like 10,000 a day, I think, or more. They just create. That's inflation. Ethereum, they just create as money they want. That's inflation. So Bitcoin has a fixed supply cap, right? It will never exceed 21 million. It's insane to think about, especially when you think about how many people are just in America or how many people in the world. Wasn't there something that just came out too about how many people are invested in crypto now? Like from just first time investors, how many new users there are? You talked about this with Uber or Airbnb went through a lot of crap, right? Like got jacked over this whole last year, year and a half. So yeah. I look at what are the what is crypto going with active users now and adoption in just general households because i feel like this when i first started investing in in icos in 2017 and i was just kind of following just put money in kind of anything that someone else said to do there was like the same couple tens of thousands of people that were like all involved in the same things and i was like this is so weird like we're all yeah. kind of just doing the same thing and now that number feels like it's it's growing a ton, right? Like where is, is that yeah. at? So they use uh, they use polls. I mean, there's really no way to find out exactly, but they they'll run polls just like they do with anything and sample a small size audience and, and ask them. But um, yeah, I mean the numbers are way up uh, somewhere in the 25 to 30 percent range uh, apparently. Um, what's interesting about that is whenever you want to measure adoption of like a new technology, you would use something called like an S curve, and the way the S curve works is. Uh, the amount of time it takes to get to 10% adoption is typically the time it would take to go from 10 to 90% adoption. And about an 80% adoption is considered like fully adopted. Um, and so uh, we saw we with Bitcoin, Bitcoin's been around for about 11 years now. Um, so in the first 10 years, we saw it get to 10% um, adoption in 10 years by 2019. So that means by um, in the next 10 years, it should get to 90% adoption. So that means before the end of the decade, we should be there. And people have been afraid though, sometimes that Bitcoin won't be that store of value that the US dollar is to the world right now, where it's like everything's based off the do dollar. I remember the old quote in like 2015, I was like young kid. And someone said that when when America catches or sneezes, the whole world catches a cold that yeah. everyone's affected by whatever happens yeah. here. And I'm assuming that probably still is pretty true. Sure. It is. Do you feel that, that, that Bitcoin is not based on it's going to go up, but just is it going to be that thing that people get first into or is like most well known or like what's that downside risk? Will there be a different one that'll kind of be that? take that spot over the next 10 years where all of a sudden everyone who has Bitcoin's like, this is irrelevant now. This sucks. Well, um, this is, uh, this is going to get you a lot of, uh, hateful comments on your video and the people are going to say, I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, but, <laughs> but I would say that, um, you know, having been writing about this and I've 
done 20 page research reports on hundreds of different cryptocurrencies that are out there. Um, part of the reason why in 2019, I decided to leave that business and, and move on is because the longer you're around and the more research you do, and the more you start to understand the problems that we have in the world and the solution. So solutions come to problems. Technology solves problems, right? So mm -hmm. it's supposed to solve problems. So as you already highlighted, one of the problems is this unlimited money supply. That's a problem. We need to solve that. So we would want a solution that has a fixed monetary supply. So all those other cryptocurrencies that have unlimited supply, well, that, what, what problem are they solving? So there's that. Um, other problems that we have are like censorship. Censorship's a big problem. Not just in censorship, like me getting shut down off my YouTube channel, but PayPal announced uh, last week that they're working with some new um, activist group and they're going to start censoring payments to people that this activist group says that they should censor payments to. Like, they don't like you, Nick. You said something bad. So now I can't even send you money. Um, that's censorship, right? And so PayPal is doing that now. So that's a problem. And we, so I need the ability. I believe I'm a freedom maximalist. I believe that I should have the right to store my wealth in a way that can't be manipulated. It can't be stolen. And if I want to send it to you, nobody can stop it, block it, or prevent it. I believe I should have that right. So then I need something that has a fixed supply, can't be manipulated, um, something that nobody has control over. It's completely decentralized, something that is censorship resistant, um, something that has immutable law, immutable code that can't be changed. I believe that's what we need. And so when you look at it from that lens, and then there's 8,000 cryptocurrencies, how many of them have those features? There's one. That's There's only so one. Crazy. I didn't know that. And so, um, you know, yeah, I mean, Ethereum is going to be this world computer and they're going to build this DeFi on it. And like, okay, you know, maybe. Um, I don't think that's the big problem that the world needs, right? Like, that's not like the pressing thing that we have. Um, the other problem is that, again, going back to 2016 and writing this, writing research on hundreds of altcoins, you know, for years and years and years. Um, you also have to kind of understand how technology works. So again, I said, I started investing in these internet stocks in the late nineties. At the end of the late nineties, we had webvan.com and we had pets.com and they all failed spectacularly. Um, it wasn't because they were wrong. It's because that it was too early. There was no market. There was no people to use them. Um, and also the, the infrastructure wasn't there. The internet was too slow. You couldn't even use it to buy stuff back then. Um, and so what happens with technology is it gets ahead of itself. And so we need to go fix supply chain management and we need smart contracts and we need uh, a way to buy tickets for Ticketmaster and we need like voting and all these things. Um, and so they went and built, you know, thousands of altcoins to each solve one of these needs. But what happens with technology is that technology scales in layers. And so all of that technology is now finding its way onto the Bitcoin blockchain. And so now all the coins that are faster, cheaper, and more private not anymore because now they're more private. <laughs> now that's all on Bitcoin. Oh, smart contracts. Oh yeah, that's being done on Bitcoin too. Um, so it's all like finding its way over. Um, and so again, uh, the market was a lot different in 2017 and 2018. It was. Um, but a lot of people today have the same mentality that the market is the same as it was in 2017, 18, 19. And it's just not. The market's different today. Um, and so I would look at the altcoins as kind of like penny stocks which I know a lot of people that invest into penny stocks and they like penny stocks because you have this chance to make these huge upsides. But the, but the, the reality or the hope of a penny stock ever making it into like a huge publicly traded company is basically almost barely better than zero. Um, and so all coins are kind of the same way where, you know, maybe a couple of them will get there. There, there are potential to make massive gains for sure. If you get those right penny stocks, if, if you get them right. Uh, but how many do you lose before you get those winners kind of a thing? So um, I don't know. That's my big, big picture view, I guess. So people I know, wanted to I know dive you're, you're like that answer. Yeah, I mean that's technically what I would even say in a way where I'm like it's something I would I would shake my head and nod to and go oh that makes sense I would I agree with everything that you're saying I feel that if people don't even look at that as a perspective that makes sense I don't see how like it just makes sense to me logically even if someone didn't agree with it, which I don't think they need to. So if people wanted to binge some of this stuff, because I'm just touching on little subjects that I'm like interested in from some of the housing to, we talked about gold, mining gold. Like when I thought about that, I was like, my gosh, like, yeah, gold's high. People are going to go try to like mine gold and sell it because it's valuable, but you can yeah. still mine more gold. Like we haven't mined all the gold in the world or diamonds well, or any of these. And also things. what's interesting about that specifically is let's say the price of gold jumps to 2,500 or 5,000 an ounce, let's say. 
Um, well, what would happen is a lot of people would go mine more gold because now it's 5,000 bucks an ounce. And when all those people go to mine more gold, more gold comes out of the ground faster. With Bitcoin, Bitcoin could jump to 5 million a coin, which would cause more people to jump in and mine it, but it wouldn't increase the supply of new Bitcoin. So that's a big difference. Um, that being said, I think gold mining plays and silver mining plays are some really good opportunities as well. So for those people that are listening, that's a place that I still play around in quite a bit. Um, I think uh, over the next year or two, there's several you know triple digit winners to be had, maybe even four digit winners to be had in the gold and, and silver mining space as well. That is awesome. So they want to go binge some of this. Where can they go like binge some of your content and go through like these niche subjects that I'm sure you have, maybe YouTube or something like that? Yeah. I mean, YouTube would be the best way. Just search Mark Moss on YouTube, find my channel. Um, you know, uh, it all it all centers around the problems that we have, which is the, the, the central bank, the Federal Reserve, unlimited money printing, what they're doing to um, the economy, you know, interest rates, inflation, et cetera. Um, and then diving into solutions, which would be gold and gold mining or Bitcoin and crypto and things like that. That is wild. And do you have any other channels that are about like the motocross or like all this other crazy stuff that you do as well? Uh, I mean, if you want to see that, um, if you want to see like the TV show I was talking about, you would go to uh, just go to YouTube and search rip to Cabo and you can find there's, uh, I don't know, 10 years worth of, uh, of, of TV shows on there. You could watch that. Other than that, like I kind of said earlier, I don't really post any of that stuff because um, I just, I don't really care. It's just kind of like my private deal. So, but if you want to see it, that's a, go search rip to Cabo. That is so, how, dude, how do you do this? How do you go do all these fun things? And build the business. Like, it's just, it's wild. What, like, what the heck? Well, or, I mean, you build, a distributed, you build a distributed team, you know, and uh, you work really hard when you're working. So, like, I feel like I'm always working because I'm working all the time, but then I take, like, a lot of time off as well. So, it's, like, kind of, like, making up for it, I guess. Yeah, well, I'll have to get on a trip. I'll have to go surf. Like all these things, I got to go surf with you. I got a Lake Powell trip this year where we'll wake surf like three times a day. We got the uh, the Malibu nice. with nine days, no internet, houseboat. That's always a phenomenal time. Have you done the wake surfing as well? Yeah, it's, uh, it's awesome. I love it. I mean, dude, it's there's not, it's not like real surfing though. People are like, it's an endless wave. I'm like, yeah, that's going away from you. And like the speed to size of wave is kind of funny as well. It's like a whole different sport. There's yeah. nothing quite like sitting there and actually catching a wave, which everyone who wakes surfs, you have to catch a real wave. You know what the thing with surfing is, and uh, to kind of go back into the conversation I was saying earlier, is scarcity. And I believe as a surfer, like, um, first of all, the world's two thirds ocean, but there's only 20 or 30 like good marquee waves in the whole world. Uh, it's like a natural phenomenon to get a wave to, to work. I have to see a storm 2000 miles away. I have to track it to see it's going to send waves where I want. And then when I go there, the wind has to be right. The tide has to be right. So to get the waves good is like, is very difficult. Then there's 30 people or 50 people in the water and I have to go fight them to catch a wave. So not only does the swell have to be there, the wind has to be right. The tide has to be right. The right location. Now I have to go fight 30 people for the wave. And when I get it, it's the most scarce asset in the world. And all of a sudden it's just like to get it good is like the best feeling ever versus wakeboarding. It's an endless wave. Right? There's no scarcity there. After like an hour, you're like, okay, that was fun. Yeah. hundred percent, man. Well, I appreciate you jumping on to go find some of the stuff. Like they said, search your name on YouTube. Go check out the stuff that he has going on there. All the other stuff you could check out as well. I appreciate you being here. I'll have to be on a trip. I'm actually really excited about this. I need to get out there. My uncle's still going ride all the time. One of my uncles that works for Fox, he's about to retire just so he can go camp and ride and travel around and stuff. So definitely going to have to do more of that stuff. And I appreciate you pushing me into doing more of it. So, and thank you for being on the show. Yeah, brother. Thanks for having me. It was fun.